Right. That's just me. Okay. Huge apologies. Has some technical difficulties there, so so sorry. We just realised we were talking to ourselves for about fifteen minutes before we realised that we weren't actually posting live. So apologies. Um, is anybody watching at all who'd be able to just give us a quick comment to say they can hear us? It does say says people are watching now, though, doesn't it? It didn't say that earlier. Ah, perfect. Okay, okay. So, um, thank you for sticking around. Um, <laughs> Um, so today we are talking about the hormones involved in labour, some of the hormones involved in labour and the importance of them, how to promote them, and a bit more about what's going on inside your body. Um, perfect, thank you Rosie. Um, and then we're also going to go on to talk about some non-pharmacological methods of pain relief, so basically things that aren't drugs or medication basically and other things that you can use to help you and how they all work. Um, please feel free to jump in at any point if you have any questions and we'll try and respond to as many of them as possible. Um, perfect, okay. So, we have been drawing some little diagrams for you. We're Fiona and Zoe. Oh yes, yeah. <laughs> sorry. So we're all flustered from getting things wrong. Yeah. We are, um, we work at Chipping Norton, so we're doing this out of our waiting room at the birth centre in Chipping Norton. Uh, we cover the Dennington surgery. Um, we're hoping that today's session should apply to whatever you are deciding to, to give that. So, um, yeah, wherever you're planning, home, maybe pre veg unit, hospital, wherever should apply. Um, perfect. So, first of all, I'm sure lots of people probably heard of oxytocin, which is probably the main hormone that plays a part during labour. It is known as the love hormone, and it's released when you feel safe and secure and loved and happy basically. Um, if you watch our video that we posted earlier that wasn't live, you'll also hear we were talking about it's pretty much the same, well it is the hormone that's released when people have sex. Um, so yeah, similar kind of love hormone basically. Um, so oxytocin basically its main role during labour is to help the uterus to contract and do its job to help the labour to progress. It's a very very shy hormone so it can be easily kind of knocked off, it can easily fizzle out if there's something going on in the room or the environment that isn't, um, isn't quite right or the, the woman isn't quite happy with. So it's really, really important you understand how it works and how to promote it and protect it. So, um, I don't know if you can read this, but there are a couple of kind of cycles we just want to show to you. So when people are feeling really, really positive and happy and safe, they release a lot of oxytocin. Oxytocin, when you're feeling like that, then allows you to feel more accepting of what's going on rather than feeling fearful and scared of it. And then when you have those feelings of acceptance, you're then more likely to feel relaxed and have less tension and pain within your body. And then some people do in fact get to this point where they say they've enjoyed their labour and birth experience and so that they would do it all again. Um, so this is kind of the cycle that we are aiming for really. Um, Anything else you want to say about oxytocin? Obviously um, well, we'll talk about environment, we mm -hmm. talk about that and how to promote it really. Yeah, so um, as Zoe said it's the shy hormone, it can get scared away. This is uh, why a lot of people prefer or do feel that they labour better in sort of darker environments, not in bright light. Um, this is why we have sort of um, dim lighting and lamps on and things like that or um, pretend candles or real candles at home sometimes. Um, things that uh, enable you to have some light but aren't strong um, bright lights that actually scare oxytocin away. Um, this is the second time I've said this today. <laughs> but um, much like the environment people usually choose to have sex in, it's um, not in bright lighting, it's usually dim lighting or the dark, um, it's the same sort of thing that your body wants when you're in labour and another way to think about that and the um, how it sort of is similar to the environment that you have sex in is that it's 
usually not with loads of people around. Um, so that's why we don't like for people to have lots and lots of birth partners and things like that. I know that that's not really an option at the moment, but there is actually some positives um, about that. And it's actually because you want to be around people that um, you feel safe with and, and care about and things like that. So mm -hmm. that's another thing that can help with oxytocin, having the right people around. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Perfect. So that then brings more on to the opposite of oxytocin. Adrenaline, which everyone has heard of. Um, so this is your kind of other cycle, you can see. So when people are having more negative thoughts, whether that's before labour or during labour, there's a lot of fear surrounding labour. Um, then it's quite often we see women have a lot more tension in their body, and you see it like tensing up the shoulders, are out the brows are creased. There's just tension in all of the muscles in the body. Um, and when we when we're more tense. Um, we feel more pain basically. So you're not allowing, you're not breathing properly or allowing oxygen to reach the muscles and reach the muscles of the uterus for them to be able to work effectively. So if you think about your uterus, so there are two types of muscles in the uterus. You've got ones pulling up this way, and the longer ones here, and then more round muscles at the bottom like that. And they both want to work together at the same time to be able to do their job effectively and for that to happen more easily without tension in the body. So if you kind of compare it to other muscle groups in the body, so most muscles work in pairs. So if you think of your bicep and your tricep, we can all sit, most of us can sit and do this with absolutely no pain whatsoever, and there's no issues with us doing that because we have no tension in our body really when we're doing it. So if you think of your muscles, the muscles of the uterus is having to work together, and there is no reason why they shouldn't be able to do that efficiently and effectively if we allow the body to kind of relax and oxygenate those muscles and take that fear and tension away essentially so it's good to kind of understand what's happening with the muscles and the uterus as well okay. um, so yeah adrenaline and oxytocin can't really happen at the same time as each other which is why it's super important to promote oxytocin we know it's quite common when people uh, first come in in labor to wherever they've chosen to give birth it may be a new environment to you. It may not be somewhere where you've been before to have any appointments. Um, and we do see it sometimes that people say on the phone when we've spoken to them, they really feel like things are progressing and everything's happening quite regularly. And they're feeling frequent contractions and they're strong and lasting a good amount of time. And then when they come in for the first half an hour or so, sometimes they can kind of slow down a little bit and they, they strength can decrease as well. And that's often because when you're coming into a new environment, you naturally release some adrenaline as kind of a protective factor because it's not known to you and you don't yet feel kind of safe and secure. So it's kind of good to be aware that, that if that happens, that may be what's going on and you just need time to kind of settle into the environment, environment you're in and feel more comfortable, basically. Um, and we were talking about zebras and lions earlier. Yeah, I think that's quite a good way of thinking about it. Um, yeah, as uh, animals, mammals, um, <laughs> I talk about them too much. Um, when we're in labour, it is a protective feature, the whole adrenaline thing. It's supposed to happen. It's very clever um, if we're unsafe. So if you think about a zebra that's giving birth, if they're suddenly um, being chased by a lion, because um, the lion's hungry, their labour will go off and um, they'll stop labouring in order to try and uh, save their lives um, and get back to that when they feel safer again. Um, and that's a completely normal thing that's very clever and built in with us. So we, our labour will wait and stop and stall and things if it doesn't feel right for us, mm -hmm. if it's all natural and, and, and things like that. So it's, it's very clever. Also, adrenaline does play an important part in some people's labours. Um, another another point called transition um which people often are quite aware of this bit, bit of labor before they push a baby out where things can feel quite sort of negative it's often when people do ask for an epidural if they've never yeah. mentioned it before so it or whatever start saying they can't do it say the f word maybe for the first time um it can feel quite negative and that's actually a, a, a rush of adrenaline that's there for a reason and it's supposed to be so that people then get through that bit and the adrenaline have given them the um, energy to then push a baby out. As we know, it can be quite a long 
um, it can take quite a while in labour, especially with first babies, and it's supposed to, and that's normal, but it does mean women can have been awake for a long time, sometimes over 24 hours, and I don't know about you, but I'm not very good at that, so I would need something too to push a baby out. So that's actually a very clever bit of um, role that adrenaline has at, at some point in the labour. Um, there's also sort of nothing stopping that if you're going to get it, and um, and that's okay. That's when adrenaline is welcomed. Yeah. Um, but it passes. It's good to have it in the back of your head. You think, okay, no, I am feeling quite panicky and overwhelmed, but I know that this is potentially a big good sign if you're starting to feel like that, that things are progressing and you're near the end. So, yeah, it's good to have it in the back of your mind or to tell your birth partner about it so they can remind you as well. Perfect. So, that is everything kind of about the main hormones playing part in labour. Unless anyone's got any questions, are the questions working? <laughs> Um, let me just double check on my phone. Okay. <laughs> no, I don't think anyone's asked a question about it. That's fine. Right, okay. So, if we now move on to talking more about different options um, of pain relief, things that can help you, which don't involve medication, obviously there are those the uh, kinds of pain relief as well, but today we are just covering the ones that are non-pharmacological, that's how we refer to them. Um, so some of these you can use at home, uh, a lot of them are probably good to be fair, and then others are things that we can offer to you when you come into wherever you choose to refer. So if we're thinking about kind of early labour as well as the main part of labour, you, you probably, if you've watched lots of these videos, have heard us talk about water a lot. And we always say never underestimate effect it can have in terms of pain relief using water and labour, it really is considered to be a form of pain relief. And you see women get into the birthing pool and instantly relax. <laughs> yeah, you see all those muscles that have been tensed up and shoulders up here yeah, instantly drop. Um, and people feel so much more relaxed and feel like they can their ability to cope is much, much better. Um, Obviously, depending on how your pregnancy has been and whether there are any complications, depends on whether the pool is recommended or not, and that's something to discuss with your individual midwife or, or obstetrician. But there are a lot of women, even with potential complications or potential risk factors, who are still suitable to use the birthing pool. There is a birthing pool on delivery suite. Everywhere else, there are birthing pools. You can hire them for home, so it's always, well, for most women, is an option. Some people choose to use it just or labour. Some people choose to give birth in the water. A lot of people do give birth in the water because they think they like it so much they don't want to get out for the end part and that's totally fine. We love water births. They are perfectly safe, a really nice calm way to give the birth. Um, it's warm water so we keep it about body temperature, so kind of 36.5 to 37.5 degrees um, and we can check the temperature every hour. It also just um, gives you more buoyancy, so women can adopt more positions in water that they might not be able to outside um, when they're trying to take the weight of the bump. So for instance, like you can squat, get into a squatting position in water, and being able to adopt this different positions, again, helps with people's ability to cope with pain. Um, also uses things like back pain as well. And then, you know, it's something you can use at home as well, in early labour. You'll often hear a midwife recommend having a bath maybe not so much in summer when it's super warm but it's still sometimes people find it helpful a nice warm shower anything really in water water can be really really useful um if you watch a previous video that's been posted we do talk about water birth in much more detail really so um just about the research really uh, people who use yeah. water in labor uh, are much less likely to have more medical pain relief, um, so epidurals and things like that. Um, people tend not to ask for it as much if they have uh, used water to yeah. help them with their pain. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, similar on kind of the heat theme, um, what most to say about it, but heat packs can be really useful, particularly in early labour at home as well. So just using either those like wheat bags, you've got them in the microwave or a hot water bottle wrap it up in a sheet or a towel or something can be really, really useful at using those um, discomforts in early labour. Mm -hmm. um, I know the hospital have heat packs they can make up in the microwave. Oh, we don't have any here. I don't know about the other birth centres. So if you're planning with the birth community and you want to bring something like that, then you're welcome to bring your own hot water bottle in with you. Well, don't we have them here? Okay. But yeah. <laughs> but yeah, 
Yeah. 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 Not everyone's cup of tea. Some people, the thought of being touched during labour, or some people really love massage normally, and then in labour, the thought of being touched by anyone is just an absolute no, and they say, no, please get off me if anyone tries to do a bit of massage. But vice versa, some people hate it normally and really, really find it helpful in labour. Mm. It's something that can be offered to you. Yeah. There's only one way to find out, basically. Yeah. Um, try. Lots of us are very used to massaging women in labour. Um, mm. I tend not to if I don't know them um, because I never want someone to be in an awkward position where they're thinking get off me so I'll always speak to them about it first or perhaps um, say to the birth partner um, about it do, do they want to try because um, then the woman's not going to feel embarrassed about sure. saying no or <laughs> get off me or, or whatever um, but it can be really really helpful it helps with oxytocin massage does it's some people associate with being relaxed and calm and, and feeling loved as well, especially if it is the partner which um, the, does suit oxytocin a bit more, I would say, than one of us guys doing it. But um, certainly the lower back, that often um, women like a good old firm rub. Yeah. Um, some people find their hips being pressed together really helpful if you've got some discomfort there. So it's not even technically massage, but literally that you could stand up and maybe arms around your partner's neck and dip to just your partner kind of pressing in there during contraction, that can be really helpful. Mm -hmm. um, also sort of uh, shoulders as well, we, yeah. we spend a lot of our time saying to women, drop your shoulders down, yeah. breathe, let everything go soft. Yeah. And this is about sort of fighting that fear, tension thing that people get when they, when they feel some discomfort, want to tense up, make your shoulders rise. If you're squeezing these muscles, you're also squeezing these muscles down here and essentially keeping baby in when we want everything to go soft and actually let baby come down. Therefore, we want all the muscles to be relaxed. So just reminding them by touching their shoulders often just makes people go mm. <sighs> again. Um, and that way you don't even have to speak. So that can be just helpful, just yeah. a light touch in um, Yeah, and some people don't want the kind of full massage, but things like um, something that's used in hypnobirthing, which we'll talk a bit about as well, but literally like a gentle stroke on the forearm or the forehead. Um, if it's something you find normally quite relaxing, you could start to do that, either to yourself or get your partner to do it in the last few weeks of your pregnancy. And for some people, instantly having that during labour done to them, it, kind of triggers those feelings of relaxation so if there's a particular feeling you like or an area that you like to kind of be gently stroked or something then that can be really really helpful as well just to think about um in terms of what we use to massage we again most places have kind of the, the general massage oil which um shouldn't have any allergens in really and you can either just use that on its own or we will now move on to aromatherapy we can add in some aromatherapy oils, essential oils, to the massage oil itself. Um, again, everywhere, every option of a place of birth should have lots of different aromatherapy oils. So they are natural essential oils that come from plants um, and have all been shown to have different properties in terms of what they can help with. Um, some of them are for relaxation, so for instance, in the lavender or chamomile um, and uh, otherwise we have more uplifting scents like lemon and mandarin more kind of citrusy ones peppermint to help with nausea so there's kind of something for everything frankincense is um, quite relaxing as well there are some aromatherapy oils we use because they have been proven in research to have properties in which help to kind of um, boost progress in labour so for instance if something is happening where perhaps the contractions have slowed a little and we want to try some kind of non-invasive things of boosting them back up again. You know that clarisage and jasmine and rose as well, sometimes those three oils can be particularly good at actually helping the uterus to work more efficiently and effectively and helping labour to progress again. Um, so that's also something that we can offer. Um, there's different ways we can use aromatherapy oils, so lots of places have diffusers, which lots of people have in their homes now, but it just allows us to kind of spritz the scent about the room, really, um, and take it out if you decide actually you don't like that smell anymore. Mm -hmm. um, some people want it in the massage oil, 
other people use it. They kind of um, have a few drops of a piece of cotton wool and they take it somewhere. Um, so that you can smell it there and again we can just get rid of it if you don't like it. Um, or oh, we can put it into the oil for massage as well. Yeah, yeah. so yeah, um, lots of different options on that front. And a bit like the touch, practicing that at home, some people find like if they, like, I don't know, for instance, if you particularly like the smell of lavender and find it quite relaxing, you can buy your own um, lavender oil for at home, or like those kind of rollable scents, you can roll it on your wrists, and it, again, you start to build up that association of the smell and those feelings of relaxation, so it kind of triggers those feelings more quickly and easily, kind of subconscious part of the brain when you use it in labour. Um, so yeah, that's kind of a really therapy and a really, really helpful tool. Mm-hmm. What have we got on our list? Pens machine. I think I got it out of the box there. <laughs> um, so, TENS machines are used outside of labour as well. Some people use them like back pain or any other kind of pain if it's been recommended to them by a doctor. And we've got a couple of diagrams. Yeah, there's a diagram. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. <laughs> don't know if you can see where the pads are placed on her back there. Look, I have two just below the bra line, and then two on really lower back, almost just, just above the, the top of your bum, basically. Um, Those pads are linked to a little device which controls... Um, the electrical impulses. Yeah. So TENS stands for transcutaneous, which just means through the skin, electrical nerve stimulation. So it's basically about the kind of, you know, ask us to explain all the science <laughs> behind it, basically kind of interferes with the way that the brain perceives pain signals. Again, they're really, really helpful in early labour. Like often if you're at that point where you're fine to still be at home, but you're starting to think, I think I need something else to help me. And they can be really good at, at, at kind of allowing women to be able to stay at home feeling more comfortable in those early stages and can be really useful in the later stages as well mm-hmm. obviously not with the pool yeah and please remember or partners remember to turn the machine off before taking the pads off which i forgot to do once and mm-hmm. it's not <laughs> um, most of them come with like a boost button so you can have a very low level of um kind of electrical um stimulation going through and then during a contraction you can, so the woman has full control over it, you can press this boost button to give you an extra boost. So I think partly it also is quite a good distraction as well, it's something to kind of think about and do with your hands during a contraction as well. Um, you can probably buy TENS for fairly cheap these days, but a lot of birth centres do hire them out, we hire them out here, I'm sure other ones do. Um, we have them here for use during labour without you having hired it, but like I said, it's often really helpful in the early stages, so if you can have one before, you think it's something that would be useful that's good so just speak to your midwife whichever area you're in about it if you're interested really mm-hmm. um there's much more to say yeah um the people who use them seem to really yeah. really value it yeah. afterwards um yeah. i have actually looked after someone recently who who got in the pool um having taken it off and got out and said, actually, I want my tens machine back. Obviously, they you can't mix the two. Um, but she chose the um, tens machine over the pool, which doesn't happen that often. But it just shows for her, it was it was really wonderful and 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 the best sort of pain relief for her. Um, and she wouldn't have known that if she didn't get one. So it does work really really well for some people. Yeah. All of this is about if you think of it like your toolkit, you're just adding as many things to your toolkit as possible because, like Fiona just said. It's not kind of one thing suits all, that different things are going to help different women. So if you've got all of these things available to you, the more likely you'll probably be able to cope because you've got lots of different options you can try really, rather than ruling anything out before you've even tried it. Um, so yeah, that is a TENS machine. Now, we're debating whether to talk about this thing because we weren't quite sure if it would count as non pharmacological or not. But this is a relatively new thing we've probably been able to offer within the last six months to a year maybe. Mm-hmm. Um, so a few years back we did a really big study at the John Radcliffe um, and there are a few other hospitals involved and in this country and in other country on the use of sterile water injections to help specifically with back pain during labour um, and it's taken a few years for the results to come out but they have shown that it is really really effective 
Um, and now everything's been approved and it's something that you can offer safely again wherever you choose to give birth. Um, so again, it's all about kind of blocking certain pain receptors in the back. Um, yeah. I don't think how best to explain it. <laughs> <laughs> it's something you do rather than think about the science behind it. Yeah. So it's right. It's specifically for back pain. That's the important thing to know. It's probably not going to have any effect on any other pain that's happening at the front. And some women do have exclusively feel like contractions in their back. So if that's something you're feeling during your labour, speak to the midwife looking after you about the sterile water injections. It literally is just sterile water, clean water. There's nothing else in it. That's why we thought well, this counts as yeah. under this subject because it's not a drug. Yeah, it's water. Yeah, um, um, and we put four, yeah. four, four little crosses. So we get you to sit, um, and then we kind of have a good feel of your hips. We work kind of work out different landmarks as to work out the best place to put it in, um, and then we work out the best place and draw four little crosses with a pen on your back, and then often we try and get two midwives involved because the best. So that's the other thing that's worth noting. When these injections go in, whilst they offer brilliant pain relief afterwards, they can be quite stinging at the point of um, quite quite stinging. I, I haven't had one. I haven't had it. <laughs> <laughs> More than quite stinging. Fine. So we try. We aim to do it during a contraction. So you're kind of distracted by that anyway. Um, so that's why we have two midwives. So uh, we do two crosses each then um, we can generally get it done during one contraction. So we use a tiny little needle to inject a really, really small amount of sterile water in the points where we put the crosses. And it forms this little like bleb, we call them, just a little bubble under the skin. That's good, we want to see that for us to think, yeah, that's worked effectively. Um, and um, in terms of how long it lasts, it varies, but I really, I don't think there's really a limit, is there? You can have... Okay. You can have more. Yeah, you have, um, yeah, several doses because there's no real, really, not really medication involved. You can have several doses, and um, so that's yeah. It, again, a really, really useful thing to consider. It probably works kind of similarly to a tens in that the position it's in blocks a certain kind of um, pain receptor in the brain. So yeah, and and most people, they quite instantly. That's really, really easy. My back pain. So yeah, again, really something to consider. Um, I think by now, hopefully most midwives have done their training in it, but if not, like say you're, you're in the hospital environment and the midwife caring for you hasn't yet done it, not a problem, we can just go and find someone who has, so it's always an option available to you. Um, so that is that, really. Anything else? Any questions so far? Mm -hmm. Can somebody just write something so I know if that's working or not? I've lost all trust in technology today. Mm -hmm. Someone write something? Mm. Usually people have written yeah. stuff right now, haven't they? Yeah. Um, well, we'll carry on. to our final thing. Um, some people may have already kind of looked into this. It's becoming... Oh, hold on, there's loads of questions. Oh, <laughs> sorry. We'll answer your, your questions now. Right. Thank you to the people who've written. Thank Hi. You. We can hear you. Uh, my previous baby was a month early. Is it likely my baby now will be early? Oh, it kind of really depends on the reason. If there was a known reason why your first baby was early, um, Sometimes it's because something's been found that means the length of the cervix is a little bit shorter than normal, or sometimes you think something like an infection or a urine infection might cause that to happen a bit early. Um, it really would be down to, well, the obstetrician looking after you generally should have been able to tell you if there was any reason and if they thought that was a reason that was likely to reoccur. You are statistically slightly more likely, yes, if you've had one preterm baby to have another one, but it's certainly not a definite still probably quite unlikely. But yeah, it's a conversation to have with, with the obstetrician because they'll know more details about your individual case. Yeah, that was done, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, okay, Rowena. What are essential oils supposed to do? They used some for my first baby, now expecting second, but I'm not sure why. At that stage I was busy and didn't care either way. 
Um, it may have been that we spoke about essential oils after you said that and, and hopefully uh, answered your question because they all have their own uses. So it may be that the midwife just wanted to um, relax you and use something like lavender. I don't know if you can remember what smell it was or if things were slowing, maybe it was clary sage. If you were throwing up, maybe peppermint. Um, it's very, very hard to know. Um, but, you know, always ask if you're in that situation again, you can say, so what, what oil is that? Most people sort of ask if you want it anyway um, and, and check about things you do and do not like and stuff. So. Yeah. Um, Alana, I had an emergency section last time after 48 hours of labour over six years ago, I'm trying for a VBAC now. How long do you think, how long do I think would be a waiting time? Definitely don't want it to be 48 hours again. Sure. So, so in terms of actual labour. Mm -hmm. um, is there a turnaround time and then make a decision to do a caesarean again? Sure. So when women are in for VBAC, which is great, and we know for most women that is a really, really great, safe option um, and the kind of benefits of it outweigh any small risks. Um, we are more cautious in terms of progress and labour and monitoring it and we have a kind of lower threshold for intervening than if you didn't have a scar on your uterus because we know it can pose slightly increased risks about that scar potentially opening up which is really really unlikely um, about kind of a 0.1% chance of that happening so really unlikely um, but yes, because we know that there is that additional risk. So for instance, we offer to examine your progress of the vaginal examination every four hours in labour, unless for any reason something's happened, which means we should be able to do that sooner. So for instance, if you were four centimetres, and you were aiming for VBAC, this issue at four centimetres, four hours later, you were still four centimetres or maybe five centimetres, and your progress was quite slow. Um, it would be a discussion that would be had with you at the time and kind of evaluate the situation. Is everything okay with baby? Is everything okay with you? If so, would you like to kind of see if there's anything we can do to help progress over the next couple of hours, whether that's a change of position, trying some marine therapy, um, breaking the water sometimes is something we can do if that's appropriate as well. And if after those couple of hours um, progress hasn't been made, then at that point, absolutely, um, they wouldn't keep pushing you at all. It would be a joint discussion at the time. And if it was felt that actually this is the progress isn't happening, it would be safer for a cesarean, then yes. We, so yes, yeah, certainly the threshold to intervene is, is much lower um, and much where we're getting a lot better at joint care and women being involved in the choices and, and discussions going on. So absolutely, it wouldn't be 48 hours again. <laughs> okay. Okay, there's some more questions. Um, yep. The Matosa Law Scholarship has, has sent one because some people are sending them to their inbox because it looked like we weren't okay. live for a while. Um, I, I had some questions I was going to ask in the live session <laughs> video. Oops, sorry. In the live session today, but I can't seem to find the live video yet. So just typing out in case you can see them and then I'll watch the video later. Okay. Regarding oxytocin. Is it linked to how comfortable slash stressed you're feeling? I know that being at home is usually the best place to be until you're having really good contractions, but I have such a big worry about getting in a taxi to the birth centre. Would it be better to come in earlier so I know I'm safely at the birth centre and that would help with all the hormones and ease the labour experience, or would I probably end up being sent back home again? Mm -hmm. That's a really, really good question. Yeah. And <laughs> there's, there's no exact right or wrong because everybody is different and has sort of different speeds of labour and things like that um, however coming earlier on when we know you're probably going to have more oxytocin at home will probably be more disruptful to you because of course nobody wants to be sent home no, um, it can be quite demoralising I think hard mentally too. it can and people think we're being mean yeah. um, <laughs> When it's not being mean at all, it's because we genuinely know you're going to labour better at home, certainly to, to a point. Yeah. Um, we don't want you to be in the wrong place. and um, For us to start intervening too soon, things like that, if you're not actually in labour. Exactly. Staying, 
yeah, staying somewhere like here when you're not in actual active labour could prolong it for a really long time. Yeah. It might really slow it down to the point where actually your baby is born later than it, than it would have done if you stayed at home, you know, so sometimes it's not helpful. However, saying that, if you, certainly if you're planning to have your baby in community in the speak to a midwife and see what she thinks. Um, we like to assess it over the phone and um, sometimes it's not that easy and, and um, so we do want to see you ourselves to reassure you that you're in the best place still to be at home or, it, or if you should be in. Sometimes we sort of want to make sure that we give you the right advice. So instead of seeing it as coming in and being sent home, um, when you first ring up to say that you think you want to come in and you can make that decision, we can only advise sort of thing, but we wouldn't say no, I'm definitely not happy to see you right now if it's actually reassurance that you need and um, just to find out sort of what, what stage you're at. Um, and we can usually tell pretty, pretty easily by looking at you, you know, um, and because we, we talked about adrenaline, scaring things away, we never just say, no, you're not in labour, off you go. You know, we'll let things settle. We'll see how, what happens when you start um, feeling more comfortable in the environment that you've just come into and things like that. You know, sometimes it takes a, a little while to just for it to creep back up. So there is no massive right or wrong, but keep the midwives that are looking after you informed. We can advise. Um, we're never being cruel with our advice. We do, we, we do usually make the right call in terms of whether you should stay home for a bit longer or not. Um, sometimes I know in the middle of the night when people have rang and I'm the community midwife, sometimes I think, I don't think she needs me to look after her yet, like look after her and give her intrapartum care. However, I know she needs some reassurance and to know everything's okay and stuff. So sometimes I'll have to go to the to the home rather than meeting them here at the birth centre if that was their plan so that I don't pull their um, oxytocin away if it's not quite time for them to come in but they're in their own environment and sometimes they just need that instead so yeah. you can ask to see if that's an option as well when you ring. Yeah sometimes it sounds like something really little but for the actual car journey as well if we think yes it is the good time for you to come in you would like to just things like music, having some headphones can be really, really useful. So you've got that as a coping mechanism as well. Um, or like if you're using a tennis machine, bringing that with you and using that in the car as well to kind of make that transition as smooth as possible mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, the same woman had another question, yeah. Zoe, which I'm going to be a coward and let you answer. But <laughs> only because I've had a week off and just in case anything's changed since I've been off. <laughs> Uh, just checking regarding face masks. Yes. I am okay to. Am I okay to remove my mask when in labour at the birth centre? Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Fine. You never expect women in labour during a labour assessment to have a mask on at all. So no. Good. Do I have to have it on for arrival and can remove once negative lateral flow test is shown? Well, here. Well, we've been. Okay, if somebody's obviously in labour, um, because we don't expect women to wear a mask during labour, then we've said no. If you're arriving and you're obviously in the throes of labour, we don't expect you to have a mask on. I say it slightly makes a difference where you're planning on going, because, for instance, at a small birth centre, often when people come in in the middle of the night, there's nobody else here, so um, you're not going to be sat around other people, whereas I don't know how it's working if potentially in... Um, the hospital environments, if you're having to go by the maternity assessment unit where there are more people around, um, then they may be advising you to wear a mask if you're sat in a waiting room area for any period of time. But because here we take women straight into a room in labour, um, that's slightly different. So it might be worth checking if you're planning on working anywhere other than the birth centre. Um, in terms of lateral flow tests, some people do them. If you've got one at home, you can do it before you come in to save us... Um, doing it in the early stages of labour when it's probably not the best time for you to be having that done to you. Um, so you're more than welcome to do one at home just before you come if you'd like to and then bring the test in with you for a photo of the test, that's okay. Um, yeah. um, what about my birth partner? We're from the same house and he's double vaccinated and if he has a negative test then he has the same risk to others as I would be. Yeah. 
I think being able to see his face and hear him is the most important thing to make me comfortable and safe during labour. Yeah, it's really, really tricky. I totally understand your logic on that one. Um, unfortunately, at the moment, I don't know if this will change or restrictions lift, but at the moment it's still the recommendations that we're asking but partners to wear masks. Um, obviously, I mean, we're with you most of the time one-to-one, -one, but there are times when we pop out of the room and let you guys have a five to ten minute break to yourselves. Fine, <laughs> take your mask off at that point. I totally understand the importance of that. Um, yeah, seeing, seeing the partner's face and hearing their voice properly, but unfortunately at the moment it's still, if, if the midwife's in the room, the midwife will be wearing typical PPE and yeah, we are having to ask partners to wear a mask. I do understand the object. Um, she's about wearing a visor instead, is that it? Ooh, uh, good question. I think it would still be, we'd probably have to ask for a mask, but potentially ask the midwife who's caring for you at the time, maybe bring one with you in case and, and um, see at the time. Okay. Well, we don't really see any masks yet. Yeah, no, that'd be wonderful. Um, okay. Um, the next one, Rosie, I have questions very... Can I just read it or you carry on? Let me just see if it's different. <laughs> yeah, no worries. <laughs> yeah, in terms of COVID restrictions, we're kind of, well, we are yet to know how it's going to affect us from our, our um, care point of view and, and within hospital and healthcare environments yet, um, whether, you know, restrictions lifting means restrictions lifted in the general public but not in healthcare. We we don't have that information yet unfortunately, but um so we could be updated on this Facebook page or on our OUH maternity website as well. Um hi there, I had preeclampsia with my first baby, he's eleven months old now. Yeah. Why would I have to be under Silver Star Ward if we had more? I don't know if she means why. Do, do you just mean would I have to be under Silver oh, Star? Oh if you have another baby. I think so. Yeah. Um, so it doesn't necessarily need to be Silver Star, but we do, if women come to us and they, they've had preeclampsia previously in a pregnancy and then they book with us again, um, we take note of that and we usually do send a referral to the obstetricians at the hospital to make them aware of it, only because we do know if somebody's had it once, their chance of having it again is, is slightly higher than if they haven't had it the first time. Um, so it wouldn't necessarily be Silver Star, but you would be advised to have a referral to an obstetrician. That doesn't mean they would see you very often necessarily. Sometimes they just like to see people once or twice throughout a pregnancy to make a plan as to how often they would like your blood pressure to be checked by your community midwife. Um, just so we've got that plan in place so we're more likely to catch it if it happens again. Um, so you still very much can have normal low risk care within the community, probably just with an additional couple of appointments with an obstetrician at the hospital essentially and um, you'd also be advised or something you can talk about at the time to take aspirin in your pregnancy because there is lots of research to show that that can help reduce the chances of getting through pregnancy again. Okay back to pain relief. Yeah. Um, massage. Is it okay to use a vibrating massage on lower back or better to use hands? Oh, I don't see why not. Oh, you would be able to, yeah. If you if it's something that you, you think would help you, then yeah, I don't see any risk in doing that at all. So yeah, that should be fine. Obviously, yeah, on your back. I wouldn't recommend it on the front, but yeah, on your back, absolutely. Um, Charlotte, I read or watched something that said after birth at another unit or hospital, you could request to stay for a while at Wallingford unit until you're ready to go home. Is this an option still? Does it matter where you birth your baby? If it's an option, how do you go about requesting this? Oh, so, I don't know if they're still doing it in COVID times, but certainly before it was an option. Um, it would be best to check with Wallingford themselves, but if they are still happy to do that, obviously it depends if it's suitable to be there. If it's just that you're, um, say you gave birth in the hospital and, and the midwives are happy, but it's just that you want to go there for like some feeding support or something, absolutely fine. If there's any medical risks, then you'd be advised still to be in the hospital until you're suitable to go home. Um, but if if that's something you're interested in, then what um, would be recommended is for the midwife discharging you from the hospital, be mentioned to them, and they would generally then call Wallingford and have the conversation with them as to their capacity and if that's a possibility, and then they can kind of discharge you over to there rather than discharging you home. Yeah. Uh, so just to add to that, in case you didn't get that, if, um, if you're well enough to be there 
you're well enough to be at home. So they wouldn't be doing any sort of medical care yeah. as such. Um, feeding support. Yeah. So, um, you know, if, there, if there's anything that's not quite right, um, or you're not, you're not well, or, or something like that, the safe place is to be at the JR, okay. Um, if the mother is COVID positive, are they allowed a birthing partner at all? So, I believe the latest we've had is that it's um, just to be kind of case by case decided on the day, essentially. Um, so, we can't answer that now. Um, I certainly don't think it rules it out completely. I think there might just be additional kind of precautions that we need to put in place with the birth partners being um, there. So yeah, it's something if that happens due to be discussed on the day when you speak to um, the midwife initially at the phone when you're in labour and then plans can be put in place. Um, okay, I think that's all the questions there. Keep them coming though, I'm actually keeping an eye on it now. <laughs> uh, where were we? we would pick yeah, <laughs> Do you want me to I don't matter. <laughs> okay, hypnobirthing. I'm not really sure if it is uh, pain relief as such. Um, it's actually quite a hard thing to describe. Mm. If, if lots of people ask, what is it? <laughs> and even as a hypnobirthing teacher, sometimes yeah. I'm like, hmm. Yeah. I guess sets um, of coping strategies and techniques and about changing like using visualizations and breathing techniques and using our words to kind of change women's yeah so it, the and the it gives you tools yeah. for labor and uh sort of coping mechanisms yes but it's more that actually um through the sort of process of doing a course or reading a book mm -hmm. however you, you were to um, read the hypnobirthing skills um, it's more that actually it undoes sort of negative associations that people have about birth and labour that people have gathered over the years of hearing sort of horror stories, uh, birth stories that aren't that pleasant, um, social media, things like one born every minute. It all goes into our subconscious um, without us even thinking about it, but it, a lot of it is negative. Um, and therefore people become sort of frightened of birth or, or see it as a, something they've got to get through in order to mm -hmm. then have their baby, um, something to endure. So something that's not enjoyable um, as such. So what hypnobirthing does is undo all of that negative stuff or as much of it as you possibly can so that people go into it um, more excited, more, um, mm -hmm. more confident, um, and just uh, more positively, basically. So they're already not scared of it. And, and so because of that, they're more likely to have a better experience because they trust their bodies um, and know that birth is a normal thing rather than a medical thing that um, is there to be scared of. So these people who go into it more relaxed and calm, therefore have more oxytocin, therefore labour may um, develop um, more positively, easily, quicker, that sort of thing. Um, so a, a lot of it is to do with words. Um, lots of us here, are, are, I did do a hypnobirthing course and whether women have or not, they have no idea that I'm doing it with them um, without them even having done it. And a lot of it to do is uh, with the words I use. So I try not to actually use the word pain, for instance. Um, I don't say to people things like, don't tense up, I tell them to soften, because if you tell them don't and then something negative, they actually still do it. Um, so that sort of thing, people don't realise how much their words um, affect people's behaviour. Um, when people say, Fiona, they've got so much worse, I say, no, they've got better, because yes, it is intense and it's strong, but it's about telling women that actually as it becomes um, harder and more powerful, this is a good thing, not a bad thing. Okay, so um, I'll carry on talking about I remember something else, but <laughs> to add to it. I was just going to say, lots of people, um, I think they, they hear the word hypno and they're really sceptical about it and they think it's about kind of being hypnotized and it's you know you need to be kind of into that kind of thing for it to work but actually it's just about using kind of the 
the state of hypnosis and applying it to a birth scenario, but it doesn't mean you're going to be kind of hypnotised and not have an awareness of what you're doing or what's going on. It's, um, it's becoming more and more kind of heard about and more and more people are using it because we know it works. Um, and some, like, so what extent you use it will be different. So some people do the course and they may feel like they're not doing it properly, there is no proper way, but actually subconsciously it's gone in and that fear has been taken away, even if in the throes of maybe you think, I can't remember what visualisation I'm supposed to be doing or breathing technique, it's it's in there subconsciously. Yeah. It's one of those things if you're going to do it, we really, really recommend your birth partner getting on board with it as well. Um, it's often them that can be a bit more sceptical, but that's good. We like you to come into things with questions and be sceptical. We want you to ask questions and talk about options and how things work. So um, it's not for everyone, but there is really, really good evidence behind it. And we, there's not really any negatives to it. So again, if it's something you think you might be interested in, do a bit more reading about, and there's different ways you can access that, whether that's kind of through a, just a video course you work your way through on, um, by yourself in your own time at home, or whether that's an actual session with a, with a course with an overt thing instructor. But we do, yeah, it's, it's amazing. Often women will be yeah. in labour and you would, the only way you really know is maybe their breathing gets slightly heavier or something, a contraction or something. You, it's yeah. really, really powerful. Um, yeah. A lot of it is a, a mental game labour. Well, so it's very, very physical as well, but yeah. um, your brain has a lot to do with it. Um, on a similar note, just talking about like negative stuff as well. People love to tell you negative birth stories and you're well within your rights to say, actually, I know your kind of story is very valid, but would you mind telling me after I have my baby? Because it all goes into your head. Um, people do things like birth affirmations. You can, if you Google birth affirmations, there's loads of like positive statements. And again, you might feel a little bit silly doing it, but we know it works. The more you read them, the more it goes into your mind subconsciously and you believe in yourself. So people will um, print them off and cut them out and stick them on the fridge or the inside of the cupboard or in the toilet, wherever you're going to see them and you're going to read them as many times as as possible, mm -hmm. it really works as well. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Um, if you're going to watch birth when you're pregnant, um, I would advise against things like one board every minute and stuff. Uh, but maybe if you put into YouTube hypnobirthing births, there should be sort of calmer, more relaxed ones, physiological ones where women have had um, not not any drugs in their labour and therefore their body is working how it is designed to work and um, if you're going to watch a birth they're, they're quite a good way to, to start with um, however if you were to then choose to do hypnobirthing don't think that you have to look like that or behave that certain way because it works for everybody differently mm. not everybody doesn't make a sound no. in labour and that's okay if you do you know it's it's normal and it's fine yeah. um, and I have looked after people who've done hypnobirthing and said it's not working, and I'm like, well, it is because you're having yeah. your baby in your living room, yeah. and that's not what um, you, you you wanted to do when I first met you. So something has happened in their brain in order for them to yeah. trust their bodies and feel safe. Yeah, it can be a very animalist. It is a very animalistic as well. So some people really raw with labour, and that is totally fine. It doesn't mean you're not calm and in control. Mm -hmm. so, any questions after that final because that was the final thing we were going to talk about so now if anyone's got any final questions go for it uh, i don't think so no okay. i think we're done uh, you can carry on asking questions by the way i think when we've gone anyway um someone answers them don't they i think so, yeah. I think so. okay um Hope that's been thank you for listening somewhat useful. sorry we were late <laughs> Yeah, apologies for the technical difficulties. Perfect. Thank you very much. Okay, bye.